Hey everybody, my name is Alex McGregor and I'm an Olympus photographer and over the past year or so, I've fallen in love with using my OMD EM1 Mark III for wildlife photos. And I've been using these two lenses, the 40 to 150 2.8, and this one, the 300 millimeter F4. And for most everything, I've kind of defaulted to this lens. It's amazingly sharp. And the 600 millimeter equivalent in this tiny package is unbeatable. But I've been having some issues recently with animals actually getting too close to me. So I wanted to see if I can get similar quality results by putting the MC20 adapter on the 40 to 150 giving it that 300 millimeter reach, but also with the ability to zoom out and capture animals that get a little bit closer. So I'm gonna put these through the test, but as some of you guys might know, Olympus recently came out with this amazing white lens, that 150 to 400 with the built-in teleconverter. And to test all of these lenses out properly, I'm gonna need the help of a friend. I'm Olympus Explorer Brooke Bartleson and I'm here with my 150 to 400 millimeter lens with the built-in teleconverter and Alex and I are really going to put this stuff to the test. So the plan for today was to go up to this high alpine lake south of Breckenridge to find some mountain goats that Brooke had found yesterday but then we got the call that back in these willows right here are some baby moose. So What's your plan? Like Hopefully the, survive. <laughs> yeah, it's super dense willows and I don't know how like close or far we'll be from them. So this is tricky. Um, I'm gonna bring my big white lens okay. and nothing else, but I'm worried that we might be able to get into pretty close range. I think mm -hmm. we're gonna have to be in close range just because of the way the willows are laid out. So I'm worried I might have too much focal length, but if I do have too much focal length, I can do maybe some portrait style stuff. So yeah, I'm sure. going to take a risk. So I think I'm going to like do the opposite of the risk. I'm going to bring the 40 to 150 with the teleconverter. Nice. And that'll give me like some range so I can reach out and grab them, but not get too close. And if we, if we are close enough, you could probably even pop the teleconverter yes. off if you had to. So that makes it way more versatile. Yeah. You can do like a lot. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna switch these lenses and we go over there. Let's get them! <laughs> uh, so at least we got to see some baby moose, uh, which was super, super cool. We showed up on one end of a pond and a mom and two brand new little babies were on the opposite end. And I think just there's a couple of us there and we kind of disturbed them and the mom is being super careful right now with obviously some brand newborn baby mooses. So they disappeared into the willows and outwitted us. We walked around for about a half hour going through the willows. We even flew the drone and tried to find them, but they're much smarter than we are. So we're gonna go find some dumb goats. Okay, so on our way to find those, what were we looking for? Mountain goats. Mountain goats. Uh, we saw there's this huge bull moose out in these willows just off to the side. The willows aren't quite as dense as the ones we were going through earlier, so we should have a good shot. I think we're gonna get them. Same plan, bringing my big ones. I'm bringing the 2X adapter with my 300. <laughs> I can take it off if we get close, but this the nice thing about these is they can let us stay a safe distance away so we don't Die. Know, die. Yeah? Let's do it. Woohoo! I'm bringing bear spray. So moose safety in this area, since this is all willows and brush, so there's nothing to hide behind. If that moose comes at us, you run. Is there anything to group, like safety numbers? No. So 
I'm super happy with this focal length here, but I think she does have something with that extra, the 400. Well, I think that I'm actually shooting zoomed out a little. Are you? Um, Because up close, it's like way too tight on his face at the 400. So are you, but, are you like including a little bit of landscape in there with it? Yeah. Okay. And I think that's my advantage is that I can pull out and get that more environmental shot with the rain coming down behind and I'm him. stuck at and 300 or static. 600. Yeah, unless you start moving around. Yeah. Which I guess you could go up along the bank or further back, depending on what you want. I know, he's perfect. Yeah. That was fantastic. <laughs> We were a little bit too caught up in the moment to talk much about the technical side of things while we were out there with the moose, but um, we decided to shoot with the same settings. He had his 300 millimeter lens, I had my big white lens. I think we'll, we'll know better when we take a look at the images after we upload them, but I think we were pretty evenly matched in that situation. There might have been some times where he had a little bit of a benefit, there might have been some times when I had a little bit of a benefit. Um, we're gonna have to find out, but that was absolutely amazing in every way. For me, I'm kind of interested in seeing if the F4 versus the 4.5, if that matters. Yeah. Because like with her ability to zoom, she was able to get like wides, tights, landscape photos. I'm stuck, you know, right there, filling the frame with the moose. I took off my 2X converter because we found a safe spot where we could get a little bit closer and. That was really That cool. was amazing in every way. And it rained just the right amount. Not too much, not too little. <laughs> but it rained enough that we are soaked to the bone. So we got out of the rain finally in dry clothes and this is much, much nicer. So we're able to compare both of our cameras and the different lenses. On one computer, we imported them into Lightroom. And throughout the day, we were pretty careful to shoot some of like the exact same animals at the similar settings and just compare the lenses and really see how they handle the situations better. And sometimes this white lens is definitely gonna outshine it, but we're trying to see like, is it worth it for the extra weight, the extra cost? Let's get into it. Let's look at some of the moose. This one's interesting. This was when... Um, oh, they're so similar. They're so similar. That's wonderful. He was across the lake hiding kind of behind the willow brush a bit in these, which was like a decent enough distance that we could get some of the environment and we weren't really like full portrait style photos. Yeah. Um, they're really, really similar. That was flawless. Like there isn't really a noticeable difference between these two images at all, in my opinion. Hmm. Nothing really significant here. So what are we actually learning? That both lenses are awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> They're both great. Um, we might have to like really push the limits. Let's look at the Osprey ones. Okay. I think that might be a really good comparison of when mine might have just that much better reach. Okay, so now we're looking at the Osprey images. I mean, their poses are different, but I think in this circumstance, right off the bat, before we even zoom in, I can see now the advantage of my 400. Oh, man. I mean, that yours is still so sharp zoomed in. But y yours just gets so much closer. Right, mine can fill the frame with just that much zoom. I mean, these are really both great lenses. I think in this, what this image is showing me is just it's giving that much more edge of closeness for the photo. Yeah. So that I don't have to use as heavy of a crop to fill the frame with yeah. the bird's head. So, so which one's better? I mean, obviously mine. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. No, I think the, the zoom the oh, let's go. Do we have any of them flying or like taking I didn't off or anything? Nail any of okay. the flight. Just the ability to zoom out. Like we're super tight there, but as soon as right. those wings are open. I think here's what I'm kind of realizing is that the advantage in the big white lens isn't necessarily the image quality alone. Like mm -hmm. the images are comparable quality wise. I think the edge is that I can get 10 different compositions from one spot where I'm standing, yeah. as we can kind of see with the moose photos. Whereas when you're shooting with a prime, you know, unless you can physically back up and move around, you don't have as much versatility. Yeah, and I, I really wanted adding the teleconverter to yeah. compensate for that, but it doesn't. Yeah. It 
it doubles your aperture and when we were out of the moose i had it on there for a bit and i i just did not have enough light yeah so i had to take it off and then i was stuck just there i'm really interested the the teleconverter on the 40 to 150 yep. with the 2.8 because you're still only getting to what like five six when you double it right Something so that's like that. still a bunch of light reaching your sensor i think that's gonna be a good one for us to test out next okay so we're back at the fox den um the weather last time we came out to shoot was pretty cloudy and rainy so now we're back just testing out gear in different light what we did today is we brought out the 40 to 150 with the 2x teleconverter on it and then again, my big white lens, kind of been comparing all of the lenses to the big white lens because I refuse to not <laughs> shoot with it. Um, but we've made some pretty good observations about the differences between shooting with each option. Um, the reason why Alex specifically wanted to use the 40 to 150 with the 2X was because there have been some moments where these foxes are approaching us and getting really close. And with the 300 millimeter prime, there's no option to zoom out and sort of change that composition. So we thought maybe today this would be a good substitute for the Prime. And we're kind of already not really loving it. Yeah. Um, I think, and we're going to have to take a closer look at the images, obviously, to like really compare. But just my first observations are, it's a little bit harder to focus when the subjects are so small and so distant. And I just, there's been a few moments that the big white lens has been catching the action flawlessly and I haven't really even bothered to try to take a photo with le this lens. My personal observations from my style of photography is if you're somebody who considers yourself a pro and really wants to get those super high detailed, really intimate photos of wildlife, but you're trying to save money on your setup, this isn't really gonna set you up for success um, in certain conditions, kind of like what we're shooting today with like tiny distant subjects. Whereas the big white lens, is going to set you up for success to the point that it's going to blow your mind actually like it's been yeah. blowing my expectations out of the water and i think the 300 holds up just fine in this environment it's really done quite well on its own as well so. the 300 focuses better than that setup it's a little bit brighter because it's not with the converter so it's yeah it's lets more light to your sensor and it just was easier to use but the whole thing is we've missed shots right there when they run up yeah so I, we're gonna keep testing it. Another thing we found out, I was having a really hard time focusing, but I had the focus tracking on where you just can put the little box, hold the shutter button halfway down and it'll follow your subject. And it was back focusing 90% of the time. Mm -hmm. She told me to switch it just to continuous without tracking. And that has worked way better. It's a little bit harder because you have to move your focus point manually, but it's more successful, so that's mm -hmm just one kind of quick thing we've learned yeah i still think that this lens will hold up perfectly in other shooting situations but we're gonna keep on testing it to see <laughs> yeah. so we're still trying to figure out where this adapter is going to come into play in the perfect wildlife kit we're tried it on the 40 to 150 down at those foxes and like brooke was saying it's a little bit of a struggle. So we need to find some more wildlife. So we're heading back up the mountain to where those goats are supposed to be hanging out. And it's a lot nicer day today. So we should be able to spend however much time it takes and be able to see a lot further than yesterday. Even though that weather was moody and the pictures would have been gorgeous, that's some really tough shooting conditions. So today will be a lot nicer. So we are back out at Mountain Goat Land. We've got line of sight on a few different mountain goats. Um, they're pretty high up, unfortunately. It looks like one of them might be moving down. So we're just gonna have to make like a pretty game time decision. This is tricky because I'm super familiar with this mountain goat population. And there have been times when I've brought my super long lens only to have the goats get in really close range of me to the point where I couldn't get any good photos because they were too close. Other times they're super skittish and they just want to put a lot of distance between me and them. So I don't really know what lens is going to I be think, the best bet. I think I'm going to stick with this. Okay. I really want to see what, what kind of results I can get. He's coming close. He's coming down. Let's go get yeah, it. Yeah, let's go get it. 
So sticking with this one, I just really want the adaptability and I want to see can we nail that focus because I was struggling with the foxes. This guy would be a, such a nice object for that focus to work out. So that was awesome. Um, we ended up accidentally bumping the mountain goat because he moved a lot closer to us without us realizing it. Bumped him down, was able to keep up with him pretty nicely. I think in this situation, he had the right lens like by a long shot. Like I was saying earlier with mountain goats, like you either end up getting so close to them that something with as much focal length as this lens isn't gonna work, or they're so distant that really this is your only hope of getting a good shot. Also, I kind of dropped my camera off a cliff <laughs> along with my own self. It's indestructible, it seems like. More indestructible than I am. But I was super frustrated kind of the whole time because Alex was able to get these sweet environmental shots, just kind of showing the goat on the terrain that it was walking on. Whereas I had to default to just doing like abstract portrait style pictures of a goat that was way too close <laughs> to get anything other than that. So I think this is the perfect example where the 40 to 150 with the converter was ideal because he was a little bit further away. I had the converter on. I was able to get like headshots and environmental. Then he moved to a cliff that was a little closer to us, popped off the converter. So it just gives you so much more reach. I essentially have a 40 to 300. Yeah, exactly. And I just a quick little switch and I was able to transform the lens to something that was more adaptable. Yeah. and this situation this is definitely the one to go with yep for sure and again that focusing thing the non-tracking focus mode seemed to work way better with the adapter once i took the adapter off i turned it back into tracking and that i love that i yeah. just put it on his eye and it follows his eye wherever in the frame yeah you had you were the prime gear i'm almost annoyed <laughs> because i feel like i missed some really cool storytelling well, opportunity well you can enjoy your fox photos that are better than mine for sure, sure. When we got done photographing the goats, we knew we still needed to test out the maximum range of these lenses. So we found this herd of deer that were running along this ridge, and Brooke got out her 150 to 400 with her built-in teleconverter, and she's shooting at about 1,000 millimeters full frame equivalent. I got my 300 millimeter with my 2X MC20 converter, so I'm at about 1,200 millimeters. These deer ran up and we were able to grab a few shots before they disappeared. So we decided it was time to review these photos. We pulled over to the side of the road here and it's time to wrap things up. I think this experience has told us that there isn't a best lens. Right, they're all amazing. It just yeah. depends on what you're doing. So let's look at those deer photos. Yeah. And so we tested out the 300 with the converter versus the 150 to 400 with the built-in converter. And we were fortunate enough to get like almost identical shots a couple of times. What um, was your ISO? My ISO is 500. That's a huge difference. Mine's at 1,000. Because you had such a different aperture. Yeah, I'm yeah. at f8 because it doubles that. And that makes sense as to why yours was a little bit noisier in the yeah. backdrop as well. <sighs> and I'm shooting at 1,250th of a second, and you're at 1,000. Yep. So you might have just played the exposure game a little bit better than I did. I mean, obviously, that's that's what I do. <laughs> I think that was not necessarily what I expected from the test. It is interesting to see that the sharpness is spot on yep. with both options. Yep. I mean, if you want a very crisp, sharp, detailed photo, you're going to be happy with either setup. Yep. It's kind of the more pixel peepy things, like the grain behind the deer, the smoothness of the backdrop, the isolation of the deer from the camouflage grasses nearby, that really actually makes the difference between the two lenses. So is there any reason you would go with this setup over that? Yes. Um, I mean, honestly, even today with the goats, this was a, a big thing to be carrying. Mountain goats, you saw, I mean, they move so fast. They move up, they move down. I fell really bad. <laughs> there are times when I genuinely need a smaller setup. Yep. So now I know 
that if I'm going for just sharp images, in my opinion, even a grainy photo can be cleaned up mm -hmm. if I spend enough time editing. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing something like chasing mountain goats again, I know I can trust that this. setup. Yeah. Let's look at this other one with this one deer looking at us yeah, with see. like really nice backlight. Mine's noisier. Yours is definitely a little bit noisier. Like I said though, that's something that can be cleaned up in post-processing. Yep. So if I were in a circumstance where I'm chasing a super dynamic subject and I really genuinely need smaller gear, it feels dang good to know that I can trust that setup. Yep. Obviously when I have the luxury to carry the bigger gear, this is gonna be my top choice all across the board for the most part, but I guess the conclusion is you really can't go wrong. And I would not have shot this with the moose yesterday. There's right. no way I would have put, I had the converter on and I'm like, I can't. I was just like 6400 ISO in a 50th of a second. Right. So pop that off, but that is the convenience of having it on and off still have a good setup. So what is the price difference? This is a almost a $400 adapter. Okay. This is almost $3,000. Okay. So maybe a $3,300 setup right here. I mean, that's saving a good penny. This is around 8,000, I believe, including shipping. And then you can buy a lot of this gear used. Yep. And you probably cannot find that one used very easily. Not quite yet, maybe, maybe in years to come. Yeah, and then the 40 to 150, uh, I don't know what it retails for, but I picked it up for 800 bucks used. Nice. So what's that, a $4,100 lens setup gets me 40 to 12,000. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I like mm -hmm. if you're gonna, if you don't have unlimited money. Right. Not that $4,000 isn't a ton of money. That is a lot of money. But it's half of that. Exactly. So you can get the EM1X, all of those lenses for less than that lens. Yeah. If you're looking to really push the limits of your gear, and you're really looking to shoot at that like higher professional level, this lens makes all the sense in the world. I'm jealous of it. Yeah. It's really hard not to buy one right now and I have this whole setup. I think what we've found from like getting the images on the computer and really looking at them is that without the adapter, the Pro Series of Olympus lenses all the way through the lineup are fantastically sharp. They focus really well, adding the adapter hurts that a little bit and it stops down your aperture to that f8 or f5.6 which hurts it a little bit but it gives you that extra reach and so you can get nice images but you can't go wrong without the adapter they're all fantastic it's really hard to come to a conclusion from a very well-rounded perspective it really depends on what you're shooting and what your expectations are of your own shots. What photos you've already pre-visualized, what style you're trying to emulate or portray is really gonna weigh in a lot into your decision. If you're willing to pay the extra money, <laughs> to have chairs that don't fall away. <laughs> if you're willing to pay the extra money to have gear that you know you can trust in almost every single shooting condition, aside from when wildlife gets ridiculously close to you, I think the white lens is the way to go. If you're shooting something that's once in a lifetime where you don't have the opportunity to recreate those shots or have a second chance at all, again, the white lens is the way to go. If you're looking to save money or have the most bang for your buck, be able to get camera bodies and lenses and adapters all for the same price, you genuinely can't go wrong with any of these other options that we've talked about today. I mean, you've built your career on this. That is correct. Honestly, yes, that's a really good point to make. Up until this past fall, I shot exclusively on this lens. That includes brown bears off the coast of Alaska. That includes polar bears up in the Arctic Circle. A, a fantastic portfolio of images was built on this lens alone. I have that extra edge, but I don't necessarily think that it's the only way to be successful. Yeah, and I'll say that if you have the money to spend and you want to get the best photo possible, if you only have $8,000, you can buy this full setup and some plane tickets. Those plane tickets will get you better photos than having the greatest lens in the world and being in your backyard. That is a really good point. So if you're prioritizing anything, don't skip on your experience. Don't skip on your location. That's mm -hmm. the best thing you can do. 
and then bring the gear that you know how to use and you'll get your better shots. That's a really, really good point. It's hard to sum up a weekend like we had. Uh, we got so fortunate with being able to actually find wildlife. If you find that you're not getting the best results from any of this gear, we can kind of jump the gun and blame the gear, be like, ah, oh, this setup doesn't work, I should have gotten this. But in reality, as you guys probably know if you've watched any of my videos before, most of the issues with this gear is user error. So it could be just taking a step back and really analyzing your shooting processes and seeing where you might be making a mistake like I was with having the wrong focusing mode. Uh, I wanna show you this picture of a very exciting bit of wildlife we found, a cow. This was with the 300 and the MC20 converter. And just look at the details on this cow's fur. You can count its eyelashes. And I was able to replicate this high quality of a result with this lens, both with and without the teleconverter, very consistently. So I would, I'm very comfortable and confident if I need to go for a really long shot to throw that teleconverter on this 300 and get some super nice images. Now, Brooke was shooting side by side with me with these deer with her big white lens and her built-in teleconverter. The main difference we noticed in those photos was not a quality difference uh, as far as sharpness or any of that, but it's more of a difference of the background blur. Brooke was able to isolate her subject better with the white lens than I was with this lens, and that just makes sense. My aperture was at f8. Hers was more like a 5.6, and I had a little bit more reach, but also that higher aperture made my ISO higher. I was shooting up at 16,000 where she was shooting down around 12,000. So these little differences do matter, but summing it all up, how much are those really fine details important, especially because you can jump on the computer, run it through software like Topaz with the denoise and the sharpen. You can take a little brush in Lightroom and add some artificial background blur. So it might not be worth it for everyone to go with the big white lens. It is so expensive, but look at these pictures of these foxes that I got with this big lens. There's something special about them. You can, it brings you into the photo. It almost makes your experience with the wildlife more intimate because of this lens. You can't go wrong with any of them. It's just where your priorities are. If you need perfect, perfect images, this white lens will get it for you almost every time. If you're willing to work with the adapter and have this other gear, these are also fantastic. So. It's really up to you and your budget, but just be confident that no matter what your budget is, if you go with one of these professional line glasses, you'll get really, really amazing results. And you just have to get yourself out there under the right circumstances, under the right conditions, and you'll create amazing images. So I am done talking. I feel like I've repeated myself four or five or 20 times throughout this, but that just goes to show how good all of these lenses are. So, wrapping things up. First of all, I have to say a huge thank you to my buddy Matt who flew out here and ran our video for us. And the only reason what you've seen so far actually looks decent as compared to my normal production is because of him and his amazing work. So his uh, information is down below. You can follow him on Instagram. So make sure to check that out. If you would like to show appreciation for what we've done here, as always, the thumbs up, the shares, the likes, the subscribes, all of that stuff is incredibly helpful for us. But if you'd like to show a little more appreciation, down in the description are links to where you can find Buy Me A Coffee accounts for all three of us, for myself, for Brooke, and for Matt. If you'd like to throw us five bucks or $5,000, it's up to you, I won't say no. So I'm finally officially done. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this has been helpful to let you decide which of these lenses is the best choice for you. And I'll see you on the next video. That was stupid, but it might work. I think it fits with what I do.